Yes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this year's uh, Copenhagen Life Science Summit. Uh, we are glad that so many wanted to participate, even through we had to uh, go digital this year. Uh, we are really glad, however, that uh, the station on Frederiksberg wanted to host us. So, yeah, we have put together a really interesting program around the whole COVID situation, where we are focusing on fast, uh, the fast-tracking vaccine development. And together with Bavarian Nordic and uh, University of Copenhagen and uh, Danish Medicine Agency, uh, we put together a really interesting program. Uh, my name is Andreas and this is Maya and we will together today be your host for this program and we are so happy that to see all of you participating and now I want to give the word to Maya who will introduce this year's program. Yes. Yes, so as Andreas said we have designed a very thorough program for you to be able to cover all aspects of vaccine development. Uh, first off, I will give a short introduction to Synapse, Synapse and what we are and what we're doing. Uh, and then I will give the word to Morten Ayatol Nielsen, who is an associate professor at the Department of Immunology and Microbiology at the University of Copenhagen and also co-founder of AdaptVac, uh, who is currently working on the Danish contribution to the COVID-19 vaccine um, uh, program. Uh, and after a short break, we will have Tommy Kaino, who is uh, the C Executive Vice President and CBO at Bavarian Nordic. And he will take you through the industrial contribution and aspects of vaccine development. And lastly, after a short break, we will have Thomas Sandorovic, who is the Director of the Danish Medicines Agency. And he will cover some of the aspects of uh, governmental regulatory processes that will um, secure the optimal safety of the final product before it's introduced to the market. In the end, we will have a panel discussion where we can discuss some of the uh, topics that uh, the speakers has co have covered in their presentations or anything else that you might, might want them to discuss. So you, we strongly encourage you to all send in your suggestions to anything you want discussed in further detail. And you could do that via Slido. Um, but off to signups. So and signups was uh, uh, founded based on the fact that. 93% of life science students do not think that companies provide sufficient information about what competencies are needed in the industry and what they can use their academic education for. So that led to the formation of Synapse in 2014. Uh, we are a student-driven non-profit organization in the Nordics that uh, with, has the goal to uh, bridge the gap between academia and industry in life science. And we do that by creating events, workshops, and networking opportunities for students and recent graduates with an interest in pursuing careers in the life science environment. Um, we inspire, develop, and connect to fulfill our vision. We inspire our participants through knowledge lectures, career fairs, and meet and greet events, such as the Copenhagen Life Science Summit, which we are hosting today. We also develop our participants through workshops, competitions, and mentoring opportunities. This could, be, for example, be our Biobusiness Summer School. Then we uh, connect people by providing this platform where people can mute, uh, meet over mutual interests so we can connect the future of life science. Uh, Synapse has recently also uh, launched a hub in Lund, so marking our international presence and uh, con we can continue to bridge the gap between academia and the industry, also across Ørsund. So we are very happy to also be present in the Medicon Valley cluster. So now Synapse uh, has three hubs in total, in, located in Copenhagen, Aalborg, and Lund. We uh, arrange over 30 yearly events with over 2,500 participants. So really, we reach a large number um, 
of uh, life science uh, people in in the, in the life science community. Um, our five flagship events include the Biobusiness Summer School, which has uh, 60 participants from numerous countries. Uh, it uh, takes place over five days in August, and we invite over 20 speakers uh, with a broad uh, variety of uh, life science backgrounds, and we also strengthen our participants' practical skills by uh, hosting a case competition in collaboration with BCG. Then we have the Copenhagen Life Science Summit, which we are presenting today a, a short section of what the usual uh, physical version of the Life Science Summit is. Uh, and for that, we usually have 300 participants over a day. And then we have uh, the Connect Vatican Valley, which is a three-day showcase tour of the upcoming uh, amazing science in the Medicon Valley cluster. And then we have the Science Mentorship Program, which has uh, 30 uh, mentees who are uh, paired with a mentor, and that spans over the academic year. And lastly, we have the Life Science Career Fair with over 500 participants where people can meet potential new employers and, and uh, hear about their, um, what they seek in their employees. But really, signups is much more than that. We have over 30 events annually, and uh, you can take a uh, place, or you can uh, participate in them if you follow us on um, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram, where we have connected the largest network of life science students in the Nordics. Um, of course, all of this would, we would not be able to do without our partners, which we are very grateful to, to have and can, uh, will contribute to us. And of course, the signups team, um, we're all very ambitious and dedicated, and we work long hours free of charge, but it's really all worth it because of the great team spirit we have. Uh, to uh, highlight one of our latest uh, accomplishments, we hosted an online career fair in September, which was really a great success. We had over 500 participants and uh, 17 uh, companies and many conversations and job applications uh, were sent at this career fair. Um, it really worked very well, uh, in, even in an online format. Also recently, Science uh, moved to new headquarters uh, here at Station, where we are now, uh, and it has really, uh, it's a really great uh, for Synapse to develop us as a student organization, being in an ecosystem with uh, similar student-led organizations to keep getting new insights and feedback to how we run our large-scale organization. Science has been recognized for our efforts uh, by receiving several awards, and we have also been featured in Nature Biotechnology and the Medicon Valley Yearbook, as well as received grants from larger funding bodies in DK. Great. But that was uh, all of it from me from now. If you have any queries about signups and what we do, you can always check uh, right to our email or follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram, and you're also welcome to check out our website to read more about any of our events. But now we should get to the real topic of today, so I will give the word to Morten Nielsen. Thank you for inviting me. I don't think I need this one. No. Um, so I am, can I get the clicker? <laughs> And the presentation is, is this one. I deliberately put two title slides because I'm going to talk about taking a vaccine from the lab to the real world. And our technology was invented uh, at the university and then later spun out in a small company uh, where we can then take uh, the vaccine and make uh, uh, a contribution to health sciences. Uh, and uh, and health in community. Um, our technology is in basic quite simple. It consists of producing a capsid particle that resembles a virus. On this capsid particle we can attach antigens from different pathogens. We can express these antigens in different organisms uh, and that makes a very uh, unique and versatile platform. 
the attachments of, of antigen is based on a covalent bond. Actually, it's a, a protein from a bacteria that has been uh, split into two domains, a tag and a catcher. And when these two domains come in close proximity, a covalent bond is made between the amino acids in these two uh, domains. So we can fuse the, either the tag or the catcher into the capsid or antigen. And then when we mix the capsid with the antigen, the antigens will assemble onto the surface of this capsid particle. In this way, we can make a non-dangerous antigens in solution to take the form of a dangerous virus-like particle shown here in this cartoon-like picture. Actually, we have uh, an example, a very good example of a capsid-like particle vaccine, and that's the HPV vaccine that protects against cervical cancer. Um, that particle is as ours, uh, produced by expressing a small subunit that then self-assembles into this capsid particle. In the beginning uh, of the clinical development of HPV, three doses uh, were uh, advised. Now, actually, the WHO are looking into only one dose, and that is because the antibody response towards this capsid particle uh, of HPV is very, very long-lived. We have antibodies after one dose regimen up to eight to ten years uh, uh, in, in the plasma of, of immunized uh, individuals. And that's what we are trying to mimic with our capsid-like particle. The immunology behind this is quite complex, and I'll not go into details with this um, uh, slide here. Just to say that there are different kind of virus-like particles, the capsids and then the uh, lipids. Um, in, the, in the lipids, they, uh, um, the enveloped uh, and uh, virus-like particles have the antigens floating free in the lipid membrane of the envelope. And that generates a different kind of antibody response. That is, for example, the uh, AstraZeneca Oxford uh, virus-like particle. That's an envelope virus. Uh, in our case, we have a very strong and tight capsid particle, and that generates another antibody response. So some soluble proteins are very low immunogenic in nature and it's very difficult to generate an immune response against them. Other uh, soluble proteins are very immunogenic, and uh, when we take the, these very low immunogenic uh, antigens and put them on the surface of our capsid, in all of these four examples I have here, we have generated a very, very strong antibody response that we could not generate with the soluble antigen and an adjuvant alone. Actually, the response we get to the antigens attached to the particles is so strong that we can generate antibodies against self-antigens. Self-antigens are antigens that you normally have in your body, like albumin, for example. Um, in this case, we have used her, the HER2 antigen, which is, which is associated with cancer, expressed uh, uh, a lot in breast cancer. Um, and if you generate an antibody response against HER2, you can clear the cancer. That is shown here in this example uh, from GSK, where they developed a vaccine based on HER2, and they had a very low level of responders, but in the case where they had responders, the uh, cancer was cleared. And we think we can mimic uh, this vaccine, but just in a better way, generating a very strong antibody response against the HER2 and clear cancer. Actually, we think that we might substitute a lot of the monoclonal antibody therapies that are currently in the world, and which is a very uh, a growing field. And we can substitute this by a low dose of vaccine where, so that the body becomes the antibody factory and can uh, help you clear the disease. This is especially uh, important in cancer and uh, chronic diseases. 
So just to summarize what we think we have with our technology is a very rigid structure. We have a dense display of antigens, and we can display very large antigens on the surface of the particle. Also, they are unidirectionally uh, presented. That means we can focus the antibody response against the important epitopes of the antigens. And that, in contrast to some of the other virus-like particle technologies, generates a very long-lived antibody response. And that is what we are going to test now with our COVID-19 vaccine. <clears throat> and this has really been a fast track for us because uh, we started in April and now we are uh, trying to, or we are actually filling the vaccine into glass vials next week. Again, we are taking a uh, part of the pathogen and putting it, putting it on our particles by this covalent coupling. We are working with um, the RBD domain of the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, antigen spike protein. And that is the green part here. Um, and that is the part of the spike protein that attaches to the human cells and allows for virus entry into the cells. If you target this domain by an antibody, then the virus cannot uh, penetrate the cells. So we express the RBD domain in uh, Drosophila S2 cells together with expression biotechnologies. Um, and we verify that we have the correct fold of this antigen by doing affinity measurements so that we can show that the antigen binds to the S2 receptor. Thereafter, we uh, test the immunogenicity in mice um, and we show actually that the RBD antigen is one of these very low immunogenic uh, proteins. When you mix it with a strong adjuvant, you barely get an antibody response against it. But shown in the uh, orange, we do get high levels of antibodies when we attach it to the particle. The last form of uh, functional assays we do is the virus neutralization assays. We show that we get a very, very high induction of neutralizing antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. Actually, um, the attaching the antigen to the particle augments the uh, response, the virus neutralization response by 500 times compared to the soluble antigen. And we get uh, virus neutralization titers in the order of 1 to 60,000 times. That means we have to dilute the serum from the mice that we're testing 60,000 times before we see 50% uh, uh, entry of virus into the cells. That is a very high uh, dilution of serum. And actually, when we compare this to other uh, vaccines, shown here are the RNA and mRNA vaccines in the middle, the green and red box. Um, and that is the Moderna and the BioNTech vaccines. That's their preclinical data. Um, and they show 90 to 95% efficacy, uh, at least shortly after the immunizations. When we compare to that, our virus neutralization is uh, an order of magnitude higher. Um, Actually, we think that we might be able to sustain and support the WHO uh, target pro product profile of having a one-shot vaccine that can uh, be distributed across the globe because our vaccine appears to be stable in high temperatures, oppositely of the mRNA vaccines. Shown here to... Um, to the right is a one-shot vaccine in mice and the virus neutralization titers uh, in orange. And compared to the blue, which is antibody titers from uh, SARS-CoV-2 severe patients that have recovered, we show that we can generate with uh, five micrograms in a mouse the same level of antibodies as in uh, patients that have had the disease for several weeks. We have been focusing on upscaling uh, this and take it from the lab laboratory into uh, a, a factory, together with ATC bio Biologics. 
we, sh we know that we have a capacity to express the particle in very high uh, amounts and also the antigen. We need to demonstrate that we can also purify these high levels of expression before we can go uh, further in the clinical development. But it, based on the uh, capacity right now, we could produce several billion doses each year of this vaccine. So these are the milestones uh, from April to now. We have made a license with Bavarian Nordic um, on the further clinical development of this vaccine and they have supported us uh, to a very great extent through this uh, last half year, uh, having uh, the, all the regulatory uh, consultancies uh, in-house. So with this, I want to thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here, and I really appreciate initiatives like this. Thank you. Really a great tour through the molecular tools you can use to make a vaccine. Uh, we have not received any questions so far. Um, so I think we will just have a short break. Yeah. And then you can go out and get a cup of coffee or get some fresh air. There's a question. <laughs> okay. So it says, I suppose the patient response data is from clinical trial. Are you able to comment on the sample population for the data? The, um, it's a bit difficult to see. We haven't started our clinical trial yet. It will start in Q1 2021. Uh, but the um, the response that we are comparing to in the human data, that's from Danish patients. Yes. Great. So the question is how the antigen is coupled to the VLP, and that is by this catch-attack uh, interaction. It's a split protein um, that Actually, the bacteria is living in a very harsh environment, normally in the gut, for example, and they have these interdomain isopeptide bonds that make the proteins very stable. When you engineer these protein, you can separate them in two, and they have very high affinity to each other. And then when they come in close proximity, they make this isopeptide bond between two amino acids, and that is basically unbreakable. We expect our vaccine to be uh, very safe. Uh, the uh, other vaccines based on recombinant protein expressions are in generally very safe. Yeah, so the question is how long uh, the, new, uh, the virus neutralization uh, antibodies are in the mice, and we do not have data for that yet. Uh, and, and actually, the mouse uh, is not a very good model to uh, investigate longevity, because they don't live for very long. A better model for that is, that is non-human primates uh, that live for a longer time and have a more similar antibody uh, response as, uh, as humans. So the question is regarding uh, advantage compared to mRNA. Uh, maybe I can comment on the disadvantage first because our technology is somewhat slower. We need to produce the protein outside in a fermenter and purify them. And you need to verify that you don't have any unwanted uh, uh, items in the mix. With the mRNA vaccine, you inject the RNA and the body starts to produce the protein. So that's a very, very fast technique. What I have uh, looked into the literature uh, for mRNA vaccine, and it appears that the antibody response is veining uh, faster with these mRNA technologies uh, compared to, to ours. Okay, no further questions?
Okay. So I would say the, it, the, the question is regarding how many <laughs> proteins on the capsid is needed. Um, and actually you cannot say a number because you need to have the antigen packing the particle. And the larger the antigen you have, the less packing you can have on th of the antigen. The particle, particle consists of 180 subunits, and for small antigens, we have 100% coupling. For this vaccine, we have around 40% uh, to 50% coupling, and that is because the RBD domain of the SARS uh, uh, spike protein is a big uh, antigen. That was... Uh all the questions for now. If any other will pop in, uh, we will take them later during the panel discussion. Okay. But uh, thank you so much thank for you. now. Morten. Morten will also be here later if you have any other questions. But yeah, as mentioned, we'll have a, smart, a short break and you can go get a coffee or some fresh air or whatever you'd like. Um, and we'll be back in a few minutes.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session now with uh, Tommy uh, Kaino uh, from Bavarian Nordic. Uh, before I will introduce him, I just want to encourage you all to send the questions throughout his speech, because Slido has this amazing feature uh, where we can upvote and downvote good questions. So Tommy would get the best question after his speech. But yeah, uh, Tommy is executive vice president and um, chief business of, uh, officer at Bavarian Nordic, and we'll talk a bit about novel strategies to speed up the clinical development process. And I'll let the table up to you. Yeah. Thank you, and it's great to be here. Um, I've had the privilege of being in one of these life science events as a speaker before, and that was when uh, there were 300 people in the audience. Uh, it was an amazing experience, but I'm sure even with this um, virtual kind, the organization Organizers have made a great uh, effort to uh, make that experience uh, similar and as, as exciting. So again, uh, very happy to be here. And I'll be talking about accelerating vaccine development. And I think one of the important things to remember and remind ourselves that vaccines are among the most important tools in public health. And if you all remember a U.S. president called Franklin uh, Roosevelt, uh, he was, he's the only uh, president in the U.S. who served for three terms, was actually elected for the fourth term. Uh, he came from a very wealthy family. Um, his um, cousin was one of the former uh, U.S. presidents at the time. He lived in the 40s, um, but he got polio and got paralyzed and spent uh, the rest of his life in a wheelchair. So, and, and why I'm bringing that up is that polio was still quite common, even in rich countries like the U.S., even among very wealthy people in, in the last century. And now there's zero cases of polio in the U.S. and in many other countries, just because we have a very effective vaccine there. A smallpox, uh, one of the diseases that probably has had the most impact on the development of civilizations, in fact, uh, wiping out most of the Indian indigenous uh, populations in the, in the Americas um, and, and having an impact also in other uh, parts of the world, again, it's wiped out as a disease. There is no smallpox anymore in the human population. Uh, the only examples or samples of the smallpox virus are in freezers um, in the U.S. and um, Russia. And again, because of a very effective vaccine. And then the other thing that we need to remind ourselves that effective vaccines are not enough. People need to trust these vaccines and actually get vaccinated. And there, for example, measles, where there has been a vaccine, a very good vaccine for years, um, it has brought down the number of cases, and this is an example in the US of measles, but we still have outbreaks, uh, both in uh, the US, but also in various European countries. And those outbreaks occur because people, for whatever reasons, um, do not get vaccinated themselves or don't bring their children to be vaccinated. So it's, it's for all of this to work and uh, to really eradicate uh, diseases uh, such as the ones we see on this slide, but also other diseases like the pandemic that we're experiencing now. It comes to two things. We need effective vaccines, but we need people to trust the vaccines and, uh, and get, actually get vaccinated. And that's why vaccine development is highly regulated. Um, in the case of the smallpox vaccine, the original one, uh, which was already developed at the end of the 17th century, um, that clinical trial, if one can call it as such, uh, the first thing uh, consisted of Edward Jenner scraping off uh, some pus from a cow's hide. That cow had been infected with cowpox. And that, taking that pus and um, putting it on the uh, arm uh, of a small um, dairymaid or a child. And actually uh, then challenging that with a sort of smallpox and finding out that that uh, person had, was immune against smallpox. 
Now, that type of clinical trial, I'm pretty sure, uh, would not occur these days. Uh, it's, it's, it's very regulated um, and starts from uh, the non-clinical research that's done in animals, uh, small animals, mice, as, as Morton was just talking about, uh, non-human primates, um, and toxicology studies in rabbits, before the regulators give the authority to companies and academics to take those vaccines into uh, clinical trials. And, and again, um, it's, it's, it's highly regulated for phase one, phase two, phase three, and I'm sure Thomas, uh, in, in the next presentation, will talk uh, more, more about the process. And now, sometimes uh, people think that companies, uh, vac companies, pharmaceutical companies, companies that produce vaccines, don't like this regulation, that uh, somehow they'd want to avoid it. But th that's not at all the case. Actually, the regulation is very good. Because if it wasn't there, uh, there would be more examples, uh, as, as is the case for RSV. So back in the 60s, uh, there was a vaccine developed uh, against RSV, uh, which is the respiratory syncytial virus, uh, which is very common in uh, newborns. Um, so they get very uh, sick because their um, alveoli in the lungs get constricted and they're put in... Um, emergency rooms, and um, it's, a, it's a very difficult disease for, for newborns. But there was a vaccine developed. Uh, it was an inactivated virus, uh, the RSV virus. It was inactivated using formalin, and it seemed to work really well. Uh, it sort of passed the first safety measures. Um, but then what turned out is that actually, rather than protecting the children against the disease, the children who got the vaccine got even the worse case of RSV than the ones who didn't. It's, it's a phenomenon called enhanced disease. And that basically put a stop uh, to RSV vaccine development for some time. And now it's only very recently that companies have started uh, again, to look at uh, different vaccine candidates, such as our company looking at our, our, uh, a vaccine against RSV and utilizing different technologies to overcome both safety and efficacy um, challenges. But that's really the, why effective regulation and the rigorous process in vaccine development is, is so important, because what, if, if these types of failures for, for RSV and the um, in the 60s can cause significant delays and impact the whole development process also of other vaccines. Now that was safety. The rigorous process is also very important when it comes to the efficacy of vaccines. And there is a very significant difference between having a 99 or even a percent effective vaccine, as is the case um, for, 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 for some diseases, um, like measles here, uh, or 40 or 50 percent, as is the case um, for, for example, a flu, flu vaccine. And in this slide, what's shown here is the different diseases, how they're transmitted, and then the R0. And that R0 means that if a one person who has the disease, how many people on average does that person infect? So the higher the number, the more uh, potential the disease has of um, spreading in the community. And you'll see measles is a very high R0. So every person who has measles on average spreads it to 12 to 18 people. Uh, so you need a highly effective vaccine to stop uh, the flow of the disease. And of course, uh, the less people uh, one infects on average, so for influenza, 1.5 to 1.8, uh, you can get by with a less efficacious vaccine. If one looks at COVID-19, uh, which is uh, on all of our minds these days, we don't really know what the R0 is in the natural environment. We, we now have all of these social restrictions that have brought that R0 down. But um, if it was left to spread uh, on its own, 
how high would that be? So we actually don't really have a good idea how effective a vaccine we would need to control the spread. Vaccine development takes time. It took 105 years after we discovered what causes typhoid to develop a vaccine against it. Polio, 47 years, and so on. And it's only in the recent years um, that we've gotten these timelines uh, compressed. And if there is a sort of a silver lining to this cloud uh, that, that, that COVID-19 has brought on the world, it is that we've surfaced a number of technologies, uh, new platforms that have proven effective uh, of, to be able to generate new vaccines, efficacious vaccines, and, and just to pick out the mRNA uh, vaccines uh, that have shown great results uh, from, from Pfizer, BioNTech, and, and Moderna. Uh, using a technology that was only really developed in the last decade, so before um, mRNA, if it was injected by itself, um, really caused a very um, bad sort of immune response on the, uh, on the skin and you couldn't use it. But through work done by um, various scientists, including Katarina Kaczlowska, in the mid-2000s, they identified a way to stabilize the uh, mRNA molecule in a way that you could sort of bring it into the body um, without um, those type of uh, side effects. And then there's been a lot of development how, how to encapsulate the mRNA so it doesn't degrade as, it, as it's put in the body. Um, and now we're seeing that it actually can produce these vaccine factories. Uh, you, you basically use the human body as, as, as a factory to make the vaccines, which is uh, really amazing. So we've, we've just seen a lot of scientific progress um, in, in, in just the matter of a few months uh, during 2020. But there are other technologies in addition to mRNA. We've uh, seen recombinant uh, proteins, um, as, as uh, Morton was uh, describing. We've also finally started to see uh, viral vectors um, being utilized effectively in vaccine development. Um, Janssen um, and ourselves, Avaria Nordic, we had recently, this summer, uh, the first vac um, uh, viral vector vaccine using adenoviruses approved uh, against Ebola. And now, as, as many of you know, um, adenoviral vectors are being used uh, to develop SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccines also, AstraZeneca among one of them. And we are seeing the results of all of this technological and scientific uh, progress, uh, where it took uh, 20 months in 2003 when SARS-1, we had identified the uh, genetic sequence of that to when the first human study of a vaccine took place. Now it was a matter of 45 days. Now, obviously, it helped that we knew that it was spike protein from, from the first SARS that would prove effective or could prove effective against SARS-CoV-2. Um, but nevertheless, that technology, technological progress in being to identify the optimal antigen, having the sequencing capabilities, being able to fast translate that sequence into a viral protein either using mRNA technology or a viral, um, viral vector, um, showed that these technology platforms, vaccine platforms, can be applied also against uh, other future emerging diseases. Uh, CEPI, which is an international organization that was created to um, combat uh, emerging infectious diseases, calls these disease X. So we don't know what it will be this year or last year. It was COVID-19, whatever that will be um, in five years or 10 years, we don't know. But with these types of vaccine platforms, 
we should be able to quickly develop novel vaccines to combat those diseases, hopefully in even a shorter timeline uh, that this record-breaking vaccine development during this year um, has been. But technology is not enough. It's also the support from the regulatory agencies. And again, Thomas will talk, I'm sure, a lot more about this. But what the EU, as an example, has done in, in their COVID-19 response, it, they set out with uh, regulatory enablers, enabling companies to progress their clinical development, uh, development of their vaccines in a safe, rigorous way by cutting through bureaucracy um, and, and enabling scientific advice. So early engagement with the European Medical Agency and international cooperation. So that scientific knowledge was shared and, and companies benefited from it. An accelerated procedure for authorization. Again, rigorous, not cutting any corners, but making sure that things move fast. And then some flexibility in relation to labeling and packaging requirements. Uh, so not needing to have the package uh, with the language of all 26 or 28 uh, European countries, but sort of making some um, flexibility or having some flexibility there. And then importantly on the legislation around genetically modified organisms. So there's been a lot of government support and European support uh, for enabling this fast progress, and, uh, 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 and that needs to be recognized. But as I said, we need, it's not just the efficacious vaccine. People actually need to get vaccinated. And that starts with people being willing to vaccinate it that I talked about previously. They're, they need to trust the safety of the vaccine. They need to trust the efficacy of the vaccine. So they need to get in line to get, um, to, to get vaccinated. But if the vaccine doesn't make it from the manufacturer, the manufacturing plant, to whatever site, uh, whether it's a tent, uh, or whether it's a school, or whether it's a doctor's office, um, and be there so people can get vaccinated, this, this will not happen. Um, previously in my career, I was a, a doctor in the Finnish military, through military service, and I had the opportunity to sort of vaccinate the new recruits as they walked in, so there would be a thousand new recruits coming in, and we stabbed them from all sides uh, with different vaccines. And with just that experience, uh, it, you know that uh, these mass vaccination campaigns will be quite challenging to get done on time um, and, and making sure that you have the exact amount of vaccine that you need there. It's distributed optimally and it's stored optimally both in the, in the storage spaces and then during the supply chain, but then also in the actual vaccination site. And if the vaccine requires minus 70 degrees Celsius of storage, that's a difficult thing. Um, there are not so many mi minus 70 freezers uh, out there. Hospitals have it, doctor's offices typically don't. If it's minus 20, that starts to be uh, a little bit easier. But again, if we're talking about not countries like Denmark, but India, uh, Africa, uh, then that cold chain becomes, becomes a problem. And it's not just the distribution itself, it's the manufacturing. Um, mRNA, it's never been ma manufactured on a scale that's needed now. Fortunately enough, the technology is quite simple to manufacture, uh, so that should be good. But then for viral uh, vectors, again, that demands a certain type of uh, technology and manufacturing processes. So. There's a lot of effort being put by companies to ramp up uh, to a scale that's needed. And that's really one of the reasons uh, that I just mentioned where, why our company, Bavarian Nordic, started the cooperations and, and 
took on the license from um, ADAPTVAC uh, on their SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And Morton there sort of talked a lot about the uh, preclinical data um, and the animal experiments around, uh, around the vaccine, but just to sort of highlight some of the key reasons why we think that this platform is such an interesting one and why we chose to um, take the license on it. I said it's, it's, it's a flexible one. So you can sort of imagine if the virus starts mutating and, and we want to uh, adapt the vaccine because, um, to, because we need to change the antigen or whether there's that future disease X that we need to de design a new vaccine against. We, it can be done quite quickly and effic effectively and utilizing the same type of manufacturing technology going forward. The other benefit is that it can be manufactured, we believe, and, and the early data supports it, uh, in a very high scale. Uh, so both the VLP itself produced in E. coli, which is a simple process, as well as the antigen and S2 cells, um, and utilizing high capacity bioprocessors, you should be able to get doses out on a very high scale. And it's the st storability uh, to make it uh, and stability to enable a smooth supply chain seems to be quite good as well. So let's see when the f sort of data starts accumulating and, and uh, as time goes by, but um, I, I can be quite confident saying it's not going to be minus seven, it's not going to be minus 20 that this vaccine needs, but it's going to be much closer to um, temperatures that we are more, more uh, economical and uh, comfortable with um, in, in, in the supply chain. But most importantly, these things combined make it th th that it will have the target product profile of, of the WHO recommendations. So it's, uh, it's, it should be highly effective. We really hope and the early data supports this hope that it would be a single dose regimen. So not having those millions, hundreds of millions of people going to get vaccinated, not once, but twice with, with some of the other vaccine technologies. So having just a single dose, we expect to be rapidly protected, protective. Um, storage conditions we talked about. And again, if we're talking about vaccinating many people that low cost of goods uh, through high scale is very important. But most importantly, we believe it, it will be a very highly efficacious vaccine. And obviously that needs to be proven in clinical trials, uh, which hopefully will start soon. Um, but the animal data that we have, both from mice and this data from non-human primates, shows that with um, either with a higher or lower dose um, of the vaccine and vaccinating non-human primates, extracting sera from them and, and looking at neutralization um, antibodies and neutralization activity, we see even with one shot of the vaccine, it corresponds, correlate with um, convalescent sera extracted from SARS-CoV-2 patients. So that's why we continue to believe this is, uh, is, is, a, is a very good vaccine. We continue to see a real role for this vaccine in fighting COVID, um, also in the long term. So with that, um, I thank you. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them now. And thank you for a great speech. I can tell you we have a lot of questions. Okay. So you made an impression. So <laughs> the first one is from Julia. How do you evaluate the severity and prevalence of COVID-19? And do you think that other diseases with similar prevalences would get this priority? Um, it, it, it's a great question. Um, I think if... And, and I'll share my own... Um, thoughts on it. Um, 
back in February, March, I would say I would have said that we're looking at a sort of influ a flu-like thing, which doesn't seem to be quite as as dangerous. Um, now, this thing seems to spread. I mean, we've seen that even in conditions where a lot of society is fun barely functioning because of social restrictions. We, many of us um, have not traveled outside the country. We limit the number of people we interact with. And still we're seeing very high rates of infections. So I, I think we still need to see sort of the data and, uh, and the experience, but I think when it comes to the spread of the disease and thus sort of prevalence, um, it's, it's much more than I would have sort of expected before. And seeing the severity of the disease, especially in the elderly and other vulnerable people, clearly, uh, yeah. clearly there's an impact. And we here we have another good question by Dan about your vaccine program, yeah. about is there any news about the financing? Um, I mean, there was some news, uh, I think a month ago or something, yes. yeah. regarding that you needed financing regarding yeah, uh, the last clinical phases. Yes. Yeah. So we're still actively uh, having those discussions, but uh, nothing has been finalized when it comes yep. to new financing. And let's take another one. Uh, that's from, uh, oh, that's a hard name, Georgios. Um, what will you say to people who say that we uh, don't know uh, what will the long-term effects of COVID vaccines be, so they wouldn't want to take it? So, yeah, anti-vaxxers, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, uh, ta taking a different, we don't know what the long-term effects of the COVID 19 disease will be. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a disease that keeps on evolving, keeps on surprising the scientific and medical community. Um, we know that uh, vaccines can be, and we know that some of these platforms have been, even though there hasn't been approved vaccines utilized on those platforms, they've had, many people have been vaccinated th with them over the years, and we know that the safety profiles seem to be good. So. Yes, it's it's an open question. No one knows w what it will look like in 30, 40 yeah. years from now. But it's we we do have expectations what the long term effects of uh, COVID nineteen will be, uh, heart um, thing and, and such. So I I would say that it's always a benefit, sort of risk reward. But yeah. And then what is left to be done before the phase one st study can start um, is from Jens. I don't know yeah, how long your development is with your vaccine uh, together with Abact. I think it's yeah. in that regard. Yeah. So uh, as Morton said, we hope to get it um, or Adaptvac uh, hopes to start the trial in, in the new year um, and there's various things left to do, so just um, administrative as well. But um, yeah, hopefully we can start it at that time. And then I will take a last question here from Kunal, yeah. uh, who asks about how will Bahrain will meet or cope the demand for the doses of uh, yeah, the vaccine needed? Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that we, we have been acting on is, is making sure that uh, there would be production capacity. We've had those discussions with various companies um, if, if this uh, vaccine is successful. Um, as, as I spoke about and also Morton spoke about, it's, it's a very effective um, or efficient um, manufacturing process. So um, we should be in a position if the vaccine proves to be successful uh, to meet the demand. Yeah, I think we'll say thank you for now, Tommy, and thank I you. look forward for the panel discussion later. Yeah. Uh, and to everyone seeing with you, um, we actually won uh, 198 viewers right now, okay. so that's quite awesome. I mean, you, uh, compared to like the normal physical event with 300. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I we are really happy here at Synapse. Um, but yeah, we'll take a small break, and then um, Thomas from the Danish agency, um, uh, medicine agency, will come on. And yeah. Thank you for now. Yeah, thanks everyone.
Yes. Welcome back, everyone, to this last talk with Thomas Anderovich, the director at the Danish Medicines Agency, and he will take you through some of the uh, regulatory processes that is required to introduce a new medicine to the market. So take it away, Thomas. Thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon to uh, this last talk, the only thing between me and you and gin and tonics, so I'll be brief. Uh, we're going to talk about the role of the regulatory agencies in approval of vaccines. We're going to focus in on vaccines because that's what we're talking about today. A little bit about our agencies to so understand what we're working with when we don't work with COVID-19, which has been pretty much what we've been doing for the last 10 months or so. So we're around 500 employees, so we're sort of a mid-size agency uh, compared to the size of Denmark. We're very big uh, compared to other agencies in this field here. Um, we authorize and inspect uh, medicines, companies, uh, and clinical trials uh, in Denmark, the Danish market. We monitor um, the safety of uh, adverse drug reactions, both from clinical trials, but also from medicine, uh, medicines and med medical products on the market. As I said, we also authorize clinical trials. We also decide whether medicines for the primary care um, use should be uh, reimbursed. Um, so that's part of what we do as well. We also monitor medical devices um, that are available in Denmark and we supervise um, adverse incidents involving medical devices. And then we uh, also manage the entire pharmacy uh, sector in Denmark. We appoint uh, pharmacists and we inspect them and so forth. We have a, a few other tasks. So it's a quite, uh, it's, a, it's an all-in-one circus, you can say. So it's quite a lot of work, but we're going to focus in a little bit on what we do uh, when it comes to vaccines. I think first um, I'm going to focus on the European um, Union here. Uh, it would take us uh, too far to go through how, how they do things in South Korea, Japan and US. So we'll focus on Europe. And basically there are different ways by which you can get a medicine approved. You can either go through the centralized procedure, which is through the European Medicines Agency. I'll come back to, to that. Or you can do quite a lot uh, medicine, uh, of medicines are still approved nationally, either through uh, a pure national authorization, a decentralized procedure, or through mutual recognition. These three to the right of the slide uh, are, the, uh, are the procedures by which the mostly generic medicines and non-innovative medicines are approved. Whilst all um, really novel medicines, and including that uh, in that field, you have vaccines as well, um, genetically modified uh, medicines, medicines to treat uh, cancer, um, CNS diseases and so forth, they have to go through the centralized procedure. As a company, you can ask EMA if you want to go through the centralized procedure, but I can assure you these days, if, you, if you're not on the mandatory list, you won't get through because all resources are focused in on COVID-19 procedures um, on top of what we're doing already. So, so that's the, the, the over, overarching system we have. And so the way it works is you have the European Medicines Agency based in Amsterdam, um, which on behalf of the entire EU, plus uh, EEA countries like Norway and Iceland, um, basically takes care of this process. Um, but as you can see, the scientists performing these assessments are actually based in the national competent authorities, like the Danish Medicines Agency or the Swedish Lekemittelsverket, uh, and others, the French here. And so um, we actually have the scientists performing these assessments on behalf of EMA. And all of these uh, agencies, we, each of us, we have two members placed in in the committee system under the European Medicines Agency. So the committee is looking at approval of new medicines. It's called CHMP, Committee of Human Medicinal Products. This is the central nervous system of the approval of novel medicines. In addition, we have the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee, the PRAC, and they take care of all the safety follow-up of each medicine placed on the European market. So this is the procedure, um, and uh, let's just have a look. Oh, well, we go actually go one back because once you have uh, submitted all your data and today it's, it's all done electronically, then these committees, they go through the evaluation and then they come with their recommendations, either thumbs up or thumbs down, or we're not so sure. 
Uh, if it's a thumbs up, then the opinion of the CHMP is then sent to the European Commission, when, which then uh, authorizes, uh, submits, uh, uh, you know, creates or, or, or uh, sends out a, a, mar a marketing authorization, which then immediately grants the, the, the company an authorization to market the medicine across the entire Europe. They're not forced to market, and that's important to realize. They're giving the right to market. All right. So now we're going to focus in on vaccines. So we're going to look into fast-track vaccine development during a public health emergency. And this is what we have. And I completely concur with the previous speaker who said, you know, this is not a flu. Uh, I remember when it all started, actually, we were, on, we were on the forefront because I talked to my colleagues in the European Medicines Agency before the COVID-19 came to to Denmark and we discussed um, if COVID-19 uh, could have an impact in the supply of medicines because a lot of the active pharmaceutical ingredient actually comes from China and if it then spread out to India and in closed down infrastructure then we would have a challenge. But now we have a pandemic and we have a public health uh, crisis and so we have to fast track uh, the, this, this development and uh, you know as we, we are quite aware that we really haven't got a very good cure. We have the steroids uh, that definitely have some impact. We have remdesivir, which is still um, conditionally approved, but it's not a lifesaver. And that's it for the time being. There's something coming in the pipeline for the cure, but I think everyone is looking forward to having vaccines, which can then ultimately help address this, uh, this problem by introducing immunity in the populations and then gradually reopen the global society again. Um, so during this fast track development, we, what is very important, and as we've also already seen, is that we have, we have a huge, I have to say, this is an epic format. This is unheard of. The amount of R&D, the amount of resources, the amount of scientific groups and companies looking at novel COVID-19 vaccines, I've never seen that before. And the speed has been... Um, you know, really phenomenal, and and of course that's exactly what also creates some dis some some concerns in the populations because it, it it can't go too fast. You know, normally it takes ten years to develop a medicine and a vaccine, and here we are we are actually in about a year's time. This is unheard of. So to, in order to guide and 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 foster that the best vaccines and those that can actually become real medicines. And I like to be a little bit of a particular, with, uh, you know, and w when we have the panel discussion later on, my two uh, fellow speakers can then uh, beat me up. But I like to see clinical data, real clinical data. I like to see them, uh, uh, robust clinical data, before I say we have a medicine. Until that point in time, we have a promise. And it's good to have a promise. I'm not against promises. I just want to see them fulfilled to become real medicines. And that only happens when they're approved. And, and therefore, the early scientific advice that EMA has offered to regulators and the national agencies are really important to help guide them in, in this very difficult and undescribed landscape. Of course, there are plenty of guidelines, existing guidelines on how to develop vaccines, but science and technology develops faster than guidelines do, and hence scientific advice in which you, with the agencies, can discuss some of the scientific findings and the designs of the clinical trials are immensely important. So we, there are these uh, um, uh, opportunities right now. Then there's a special um, task force, a COVID-19 emergency task force, which has been put up, which can offer rapid scientific advice and help to design uh, the best possible studies. And then you have uh, this support for medicine and vaccine developers. And, and, you know, we also have to advise on what, how these uh, developers can, can make sure that they have the appropriate quality of the vaccines. The quality is about, uh, you know, how the vaccine is manufactured, that it can be kept under the right conditions, uh, stability studies and so forth, and of course, safety and efficacy. These are the, 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 uh, the drug development uh, interactions with agency. Now, under normal circumstances, in peacetime, if we consider COVID-19 wartime, then normally you start off in your pharmaceutical quality uh, and, 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 and non-clinical in vitro studies, and you have small-scale in vitro studies. You move into animals, and as we heard earlier, um, animal models are necessary. They're necessary for pharmacology and 
a mechanism of action stutters, they're necessary for safety stutters, but they are not human stutters. And uh, unfortunately, I have to again be the particular, although we can celebrate good results in animal stutters, I've been in this business long enough to see that only a small fraction of what turns out to be good in, what is good in animals, turns out to be good in humans. So only a small fraction of that. So that's, that's really um, always the risk when you develop um, medicines. That's the attrition rate going from animal to clinical stutters. And then you perform your clinical trials. I'll come back to those in a second. Phase one stutters, phase two stutters, and phase three stutters. In this time here, in this, uh, under these circumstances, we, we have seen stutter designs compressing one, two, three, almost into seamless clinical programs, which we, under normal circumstances, are not too happy about, because then it's more difficult to be very clear about the hypothesis that we want to test and so forth. But under these public health crisis conditions, we can accept having these uh, compressed stutter designs. Then these data are submitted to the EMA, we go through the evaluation, and then you scale up. This is a very long process, this is 10 years. I mean, the evaluation uh, for the European Medicines Agency under normal circumstances are 270 days. And that's because a lot of stuff is sent in. And very often there are questions back and forth, and only then do the manufacturers, uh, do the, um, the, the industry start the manufacturing, because it's very expensive. And quite frankly, you don't want to invest in huge manufacturing capacities if your medicine isn't approved. That's actually loss of, of investments, and, and no one really likes that. So, so that's under the normal circumstances. I'll come back to what happens under accelerated. Just let's focus a bit on the phase one. Typically, 20 to 100 healthy volunteers. When it's vaccines, uh, and it's vaccines, not cancer vaccines, but in this case, vaccines against the virus, then everyone in these studies are healthy volunteers, or at least not ill with a certain disease. They, they can have comorbidities, of course, but they're healthy volunteers. And in the beginning, all you actually want to look at is, does it seem to work? And which you can do in phase one in a vaccine situation, but you can still look at immunity. Uh, are there any serious side effects? Is this at, at all, is it safe to go further into larger scale studies? That is what phase one can do. And when, uh, when companies announce their results from phase one and say, oh, we have this fantastic result, then always remember these are 20 to 100, max 150 healthy volunteers, and there's a long way from a phase one result until you have a medicine. But, you know, every time you survive, every time, not the healthy volunteer, but every time a medicine survives to the next phase, we're always happy. We're, of course, happy that volunteers survive always. Then we're in phase two, several hundred volunteers, and here again, you look at the common short-term side effects, because these are not long-term studies, and you look at the optimal dose regimen, uh, because you really need to know which dose regimen, which dose you need to give. In vaccines, you basically ask yourself, is one shot enough, or do you have to give uh, a, a couple of shots? That's, that's the whole discussion. And the reason you need to give two shots for the vaccines, of course, is that you need to have uh, the immune system fully up and running, so that in many cases one shot isn't enough. Of course, it's easier. It's the uh, target product profile, in particular if you're on the rural parts in, in developing countries, then it's really not always easy to get uh, your subjects uh, you have to vaccinate into the clinic or have to get out. So, uh, so th it is better if you can give one shot, but that might not always be enough. And then you come into the phase three and thousands of volunteers. And let me say it very clearly, what we're seeing these days here these are, it's like, it's like, big, like uh, the, the project of getting uh, uh, the first man to the moon. This is how big this is. It is the enormous efforts in getting all this off ground and landing safely and bringing them back because we have 20, 30, 50, 60,000 volunteers in these studies. These are humongous studies. Um, and of course, that's important to realize and to remember when we talk about, can we trust the data? Isn't this too speedy? When we have this amount of volunteers, we have a better chance of detecting rarer side effects and we have a better chance of identifying efficacy faster. Uh, and that's the whole idea with these big studies. Now, of course, it plays to the benefit that COVID-19 hasn't been under control and in many parts of the world you've seen huge pandemic numbers. Hadn't we had that, it would have taken a long time to develop the vaccine. So, you know, even though we would all ha would have been, uh, we, we would have wished to be without the pandemic, 
then of course having it out there in this size allow us to actually develop vaccines faster. So there's always some good in what otherwise is bad, but that's one of the reasons we can develop them uh, with this speed. And then we also have to realize that, that a lot of resources, a lot of investments have gone into this, also from governments. And I think that's pretty fair under these circumstances. I think it's fair that we as, as, uh, as country uh, administrators and politicians say, we want the vaccines faster, uh, we have to co-invest to a certain uh, extent into this. So this is the very advanced uh, digital transformed world, as you can see here, of what approval of medicines is all about. It's simply making the benefit risk assessment. It's pure and simple. Of course it isn't. It's not that black and white. But this is what it is about. It's to look at all the, dat the data, the totality of the data for the dossier for that particular medicine, and you take a look and say, are the benefits outweighing the risks? Is the efficacy we see big enough? Do we have side effects that are unacceptable? In the case of a vaccine, you most certainly can't accept to introduce diseases which are worse than the, than the disease you want to cure, because otherwise you're actually in, uh, treating otherwise healthy or at least sort of healthy uh, population, you really can't introduce something worse. It's of course a different discussion when you talk about a cancer. If you have, a, if you have patients with an incurable cancer, uh, then of course you can accept significant side effects because the prospect for that particular patient population is very um, uh, challenging. When you talk about vaccinating the entire population, you have to be pretty damn sure that you're not introducing significant problems. Of course, when you vaccinate, you can expect some react uh, re reactions to the vaccine, local reactions, some pain, some swelling, uh, some redness, uh, you can uh, expect transients, uh, fever and so forth, but you shouldn't really have so much more than that. So that's the challenge. Then you also have to look at the mortality of the overall impact of the disease you are you're trying to uh, prevent with a vaccine. So now to the accelerated development and approval. This is the view of the uh, developers right now or the regulators. This is a blurred, super high speed train and it has to stay on tracks and has to arrive safely at the station. So here, this is a, an overall, I stole, the, I have to say I stole these pictures, I didn't make them myself, so I don't want to take any credit for that. These are all stolen from the European Medicines Agency's homepage. So you can actually go in there and you can get much cleverer uh, than, than listening to me. But I'll, I'll try anyway to explain the differences. You can see what I explained. To the left, the standard development, it takes forever, it takes 10 years. And to the right, everything has been compressed. And how can that happen? And what about the evaluation of this, of this uh, uh, submission. So again, you, this is what I showed you before. You go in a fairly serial way. It's all in sequence, pharmaceutical quality, the in vitro studies, non-clinical research in animals, the, the phase one, two, three studies. You submit it, you evaluate it. Only once everything has been finalized and the dossier is submitted, you, you've evaluated and then you scale up the production, and then you have some studies after authorization. You have your risk management plan, which is mandated under these circumstances. That's the standard um, game. Now, we are in a non-standard situation. And what you can see, the big difference is, a lot of this is done in parallel or semi-parallel. So you actually start with much more intense scientific evaluation and authorization earlier. And I'll come back to the what, and this is probably this is possible in, uh, under EU law. Uh, it's also possible in other um, areas, of course. And you also see that the uh, large-scale production is started at risk before the authorization. So a lot of things are done at risk. At risk means at the risk for uh, losing money. That's what it means. It's not it's not at risk for the subjects in the studies. It is at risk for the company. To, to lose their investments. It's also at risk for us as regulators because we have to be lined up and invest significant resources in being ready and evaluating something which may fail. But again, we have decided uh, unanimously across the board that of course we will do this because uh, we have a, uh, a global health crisis. However, there is no difference in the requirements for safety, quality and efficacy. 
There is no difference between the difference, the requirements in safety, quality and efficacy between the standard conditions and the COVID-19 accelerated conditions. And this is very important for me to say. We are not shortcutting our scientific scrutiny during the accelerated review and approval times. We are not. We are lining up earlier and we are conducting what is called rolling reviews. A standard review on top of this slide is you do all your development, you send it in and then you look at it. During the COVID-19 crisis, you send in your data in batches during a rolling review and you review it batch by batch so you are actually getting it in live almost. This has to be agreed up front between the applicant and EMA but this is what we, we do and currently there are three vaccines undergoing rolling reviews and this is public knowledge so that's the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, it's the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine is the Moderna vaccines and for sure the other ones that a little bit later in the phase three programs will will add to this portfolio and for each of those you start looking at the clinic the, the the quality package the non-clinical data because the phase three studies are just being finalized and you have all seen the amazing results which I have to remind everyone are press releases so I wouldn't open all the Dom Perignon bottles uh, right now I would keep them in my fridge until later, maybe New Year's evening, uh, because it's too early to celebrate based on, uh, on, uh, on press releases, unless of course you are a shareholder, which I'm not. I'm working for an agency, so I don't get any benefits for these press releases. I'm sure some will, will, will do. So you can hear I'm a little bit critical to these press releases that a little bit prematurely start celebrating uh, good news before we've seen the data. All right, anyway, so this rolling review will allow us to actually have a very shortened timeline. And uh, actually, uh, during these days, we have uh, discussions between the Commission, EMA, and, and uh, the heads of agencies. We are discussing how we can shorten uh, the time from EMA opinion until we can grant a marketing authorization. The marketing authorizations that will be granted are conditional, which you can also go in and read more on, on EMA's homepage. This means, under certain con conditions, you can grant a marketing authorization earlier, even if the phase three studies are actually still ongoing. In, in a vaccine situation, they are ongoing in terms of follow-up, so they are following the, the, the study subjects. That means if we see something dodgy, if something happens, we can take the authorization back, and it's only valid a year, and then it has to be renewed, and at that time, the company has to uh, submit more information and then it can be renewed again for another year. It can then be made permanent if everything is, is fine. So this is a tool which will allow us to um, issue marketing authorizations earlier. I also want to say something else. What happens in US and UK with these vaccines are not approvals. These are emergency use authorizations. It's not the same. This is a real approval we're giving, albeit it's conditional. Whilst what you see in US under US law, and I guess it's the same with UK, which recently um, you know, left the European Medicines uh, Network uh, collaboration because of Brexit, they have um, emergency clauses. I'm not saying that they're not deep into the details, I'm just saying it's not the same. Right, so that's it. This is what happens uh, uh, these days here, and this is the pr procedure that, that is ongoing. Uh, we have uh, scientists from our agency deeply involved in, in these processes, uh, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions you might have. Yes. Really good questions for you. But first of all, thank you for a very nice speech. It was some really great views to, to add to the whole vaccine development uh, aspect. Uh, Emilia asked, how long are the studies you perform in order to evaluate the side effects from a vaccine? Do you conduct long-term follow-ups? Well, let me start by saying, I don't conduct these studies. These are the companies who conduct the studies. So I guess the question is to the companies. And so absolutely, uh, the protocols, which by the way, for these vaccines have been made public, which is also uh, very good in, in the name of transparency. These studies continue for two years. So there will be uh, in the phase three studies, there is two-year follow-up. However, as long as the vaccines are marketed, 
they are followed up by mandatory pharmacovigilance. So that means that um, healthcare professionals, they have to uh, report adverse drug reactions following these vaccines. And we keep our eyes on this and we have a, a national database in Copenhagen and we have a European database, Eurovigilance, into which all these uh, adverse or suspected adverse drug reactions end up. So we can track it as long as the medicines are on the market. But these studies here are two years. Now, if, if we see something um, during this period of time, we can mandate um, longer term follow up. We can mandate companies to do something else. But right now, it's a two year follow up for these vaccines. Okay. And I think we'll take uh, one other question. Also, do you, I think this is really interesting, do you believe rolling reviews, so to speak, uh, will become the new norm moving forward compared to standard reviews? Nope, um, I don't believe that. Uh, not unless we are willing to increase taxes in Europe so that we can add, uh, hire more people because this is a very resor resource intense um, uh, procedure. Now, when I say no like that, I want to add that what we're currently seeing and what I suspect will happen not because of COVID-19, but because of the need for digital transformation, is that we will, in the European Union, we will become better at analyzing raw data. And so the more you can submit in a more seamless way and get an analytical systems up and running, the less resource intense a lot of this will be. But right now, a rolling review is extraordinary heavy workload. It means we're basically pooling in expertise to look at these. But I have to remind everyone on uh, that there are a lot of other diseases out there that need to be treated. So we can't just keep the rolling reviews as the focus unless significant resources would be added in. And I don't expect that that will happen. So the, the short answer is no. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I think we will keep it at that for now, and then we'll take some of the other questions for the panel discussion. Uh, so thank you once again for your view. Um, and for you at home, we will have a short break, and then we will be back with the very exciting panel discussion to come. So please, again, send in your any suggestions you might have uh, or anything else that you want to discuss in further detail. Um, see you soon again.
has now reached the number question and we have shown that even more people are watching now. So I would also say that the internet is part of this whole where we can actually ask about some of the really interesting and and we'll take some questions um, which has been asked um, the whole session. So we have a question to begin with and that is, is fast tracking vaccines at the expense of safety tests and detection of side, uh, side effects? And let's start with Thomas. I feel, I mean, yeah, that is within your field and then we'll elaborate a bit afterwards. So, so the short answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> um, because uh, we, as I explained, we have exactly the same criteria and demands for safety evaluation um, in the COVID-19 as we would have in a non-COVID-19 situation. I think the only thing to be very transparent about, of course, is that when these uh, vaccine dossiers, when the data are submitted to regulatory review, we do not have one year or two years follow up. Uh, if we wanted that, which could be a reasonable uh, or at least a request, then we could all sit down and wait with the current status of closed societies for another one to two years. And that has a huge implication for public health and, f and, and the economy as well. So, so when you make a decision saying we can accept, so the 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 median follow up for the last uh, so included would be two months. Yeah. But a, a significant proportion of these 20, 40, 60,000 subjects would be longer, right? So we will have a very large safety database. But of course, if so, we won't have one year's efficacy. We won't have one year's safety. That will come as we. Uh, as we follow the vaccines uh, subsequently. So that's the balance, quite frankly. And 100%, and as you also know, I'm sure all the viewers will know, 100% sure of something doesn't exist in biology. So I think, uh, again, this was a little bit longer, but that's the rational, the thinking behind saying it's good enough. But it's, it, there's, there is no, uh, there's no increased risk of uh, adverse drug events or, 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 or you know, real safety problems popping up. And, and, and the last point I want to make, with one known ex exception that you may also know, the, the pandemics. But, you know, generally, you don't see side effects of vaccines popping up after six or 12 months. It's not yeah. the same as a daily accumulated dosing regimen where you see something. So that's also very important to, to remember. Yeah. I mean, and, I mean, Tommy, I kind of also want you, if you can add something, because, I mean... You have more of like yeah the company perspective on it um, instead of just yeah the regulatory. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add on it. Sure, yeah. and, and and just sort of to um, support what Thomas was saying, I think the regulatory process that I have put in place will be as rigorous. Um, and looking at safety and efficacy, uh, the rolling submissions I think do a lot because you actually get the data real time and can sort of progress it rather than waiting waiting for it all to be finished. So I think that will sort of cut through um, a lot of the wasted time, if you will. I would still, however, it is this sort of long-term data that I think we all will benefit uh, sort of achieving, both in terms of uh, durability of the response, um, but then also comparison of the different vaccines going forward. So I would hate that society here in the Western world or other parts of the world would be in a position where we just sort of accepted the first three or five vaccines and then that's it because we need to make it possible to develop uh, and commercialize uh, other vaccines if they're proven to be even more efficacious, more durable, um, or cheaper to manufacture or, or, or things like that. So I think that's to me, that's the um, so the next step, and, uh, and how how authorities and others will sort of view that sort of ongoing development of additional vaccines uh, for, for this disease. I think I will actually just um, yeah take you a bit on that and ask you, Morten, because I mean your collaborative vaccine is not in clinical trials yet, and will probably come out later than most other vaccines. And I mean. Personally, I would think that is kind of a downside, but I mean, it, of course, then you have to prove um, additional if, if efficiency and stuff. But I mean, what is your own thoughts on like coming a bit late in the game compared to 
the early vaccines like the mRNA vaccines coming out. Uh, yeah, hopefully uh, in the uh, in the beginning of the new year. Yeah, the problem is, of course, that you need to uh, measure yourself against or measure one vaccine against others. Yeah. And as there is a registered vaccine soon, hopefully, it will be very difficult uh, to make a phase three because you have to give that vaccine uh, as well. Uh -huh. So it'd be very difficult until we have what we call a surrogate marker where for example an, a threshold of antibody that you have to be above to be protected before that uh, is is realized then it's it will be very difficult to start a new phase three i can also i think i, I can add to the previous that the reason why it has been able to go so fast as it has is that all the public money that has been entered into vaccine development has de-risked uh, the, uh, the development for the commercial companies. And that's why it's going so fast. They can start scale up uh, while they're doing phase one and they can do uh, f uh, filling while they're do doing phase three. So that's why it's, it's very rapid at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's really nice that things are going so fast as it is right now. I mean, hopefully we, everyone wants a vaccine right now. But yeah, I think we should take another question. And that is from Eugene, uh, who says, given that current candidates announced by Pfizer and Moderna requires ultra freezing, uh, how can we secure distribution to remote places that have limited facilities? I th was it you, Tommy, who, uh, w I mean, it was in your talk, so I mean, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on it, if, if possible. Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, there is a, Merck vaccine against Ebola that also requires, um, I think it's minus 60, minus 70 degree uh, storage. And it's been successfully deployed in the Congo, where, which is a fairly rural <laughs> area and, and, and then very difficult to get to. So it can be done. Um, having said that, that, those vaccinations are, of course, on a very different scale than we would be looking for, for COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, I think both Pfizer and Moderna are very uh, good companies. There's been a lot of development. Uh, I know specifically for Pfizer because it's public um, how they've been thinking about transport and storage. So these are all engineering things uh, or, and, and engineering you, you can always solve by throwing enough money at it and resource. So um, I, think, I think it'll work out. Um, having said that, I'm sure there will be other vaccines coming, which will be hopefully easier and less expensive uh, to uh, construct the supply chain yeah. for. Yeah, I actually can't remember. I mean, I think you mentioned it, but where is yeah, your collaborative vaccine? How, what temperature is that coming, like, secure uh, at a yeah, biological, uh, what is it called? Yeah. Um, st stable at? Yeah, at the moment we yeah. have it uh, at minus 20, oh. but we are investigating at both in the fridge and also in ambient temperature, and it, it actually looks quite good. But I also know that Pfizer, BioNTech, they're looking at freeze-drying their vaccine, which would then mean that they can uh, store the vaccine uh, at uh, higher uh, temperatures. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting. And also, I mean, just, I mean, you mentioned Moderna. I mean, so as it is for now, I mean, I understand that Denmark does not have an agreement with Moderna, right? Well, or, uh, no, no. I mean, the way it works is that the European Union oh, yeah, uh, yeah. signs on behalf and then there are fa five days to opt out. Yeah. So we just have a ah, okay. uh, <laughs> a system in Denmark which it takes just to make sure that the politicians yeah. get their time. So, so I mean... Uh, it, I can't speak on behalf of whether no. they would opt out, but that would be the first opt out they've done so far. Yeah. So I would be surprised if they do Because, so. I mean, I think I read the other day, I, I just looked through your web page and all the agreements with yeah, um, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer and Acid, uh, and the Ox, um, yeah, AstraZeneca. Just, yeah, exactly. And I just, maybe I've just, <laughs> yeah, didn't see. No, no, you haven't overlooked it. We yeah. have... Those uh, and Sanofi, GSK and CureVac. Yeah. Moderna was signed today with the European Commission and yeah. then there's a five days opt out. Ah, okay. And within <laughs> those five days, the Danish uh, government will inform us in, the, in my agency, yeah. uh, yes, we will not opt, opt out or okay. we will, but the, I, I would be surprised, but let's yeah. see. And in that case, uh, we are in that game as well. Ah, okay. So, so just to add, uh, uh, and because of this, we have actually a, a menu 
once they get approved and arrives, we have a menu of vaccines with different technology. And even for those that are currently have stability data on minus 70, because it's accelerated, it can, it, you know, you can't rule out that stability data would arrive later on, which can, would show that you don't need. Yeah. But because everyone is waiting, everyone in EU is currently planning for the ultra cold chain of minus 70 for messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, we all hope that it won't be necessary. And to answer your question, uh, it may not be it's the messenger RNA vaccines that first will be uh, coming out to other areas of the world where logistics are more difficult to handle. It's not just whether you can have a freezer. It has to be kept like that all the way out to the end. And at least for the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech, you really can't have it out of minus 70 for that long. And in particular, if you are above ambient which you will be in some uh, countries in Africa, you run into problems. Yeah. So there will be other vaccines. And and now I have to say something which diplomatically isn't very well, uh, very good, <laughs> but at least from my point of view, I haven't seen the clinical data from the uh, and long-term follow-up from the Chinese or the Russian vaccines. So I, I really hope that both the Chinese developers and authorities and the Russian vaccine developers and authorities put the same scrutiny in because they might very well be supplying parts of the world that currently won't be supplied with these vaccines. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, let's take an another one. David, do you have one? So yeah, that's from Anita. Um, how will you make sure that a vaccine developed just in one to two years uh, in contractation to 10 to 15 years will be safe enough with minimal side effects? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, let's start with... I think we've answered. Yeah, yeah I, think, I also feel, I mean, yeah, we have... Just around. to repeat it, but, it yeah. but, you know, these questions keep popping up because yeah. they're important questions. Yeah. So let me remind ourselves that the, um, the underlying number of subjects in the pandemics which had this problem, as a given example, there were 6,000 in the total database for pandemics. Similar vaccines, other vaccines, we're talking about two or 3,000. In these studies, per vaccine, we have 20, 40, 60,000. These are huge studies. Yeah. So that's one reason why we feel rather confident. Yeah. The other reason is that we apply exactly the same scrutiny, exactly the same scrutiny, review scrutiny. And actually, the reason we can review the vaccines on a shorter time frame is that we start earlier and we review these data as they come in, as I explained, in rolling reviews. So that's the reason, and we put really a lot of people on this. And, and then I want to say, in Europe, we have a rapporteur, which is one country, which does the review on behalf of uh, EU, and a co-rapporteur, two independent teams review, and then we have peer review. It's an extraordinary uh, scrutinizing process. That's why I feel we are absolutely as confident as for any other medicine we approve. And so the development shortage that you've seen is also, as you pointed out, the huge amount of investments that are gone into this. And that everyone has been focusing on the same uh, ball on the field, on the playing field. So I think there are many good reasons. We can't do this every time we want to develop a new uh, medicine. Yeah. Because then we'll run out of resources. But in a public health crisis where everyone is on the same challenge, then it's possible. Yeah, and, and maybe just to add to that, because I think um, Thomas made an important point in terms of the funding and the, how that makes it possible to circumvent some of these steps. Because those phases, actually, it's also for the pharmaceutical company. They're not going to invest into manufacturing a vaccine before they... Typically, before they it sort of passes and there's market approval because you don't want a stock of vaccine that you can't sell. Um, you don't want to initiate a phase three trial before you have sort of the phase one trial almost done or even phase two trials. And here, things just moved very quickly because you could take the financial risk of investing. I think Pfizer invested two billion dollars in their vaccine development. They did that, um, and and then some of the other companies got very significant funding from the mainly from the U.S. government. Uh, so I think that there's a lot. It's it's not that uh, that 10 to 15 years all do, do because you're just following up these patients for such a long time. There's also a time there where you're not making decisions because you don't want to take the financial risk. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it is, yeah, yeah, it's totally understanding. I mean, it's, there's so much money in this right now. I also, I mean, is yeah, the US government had also invested, yeah, quite hugely, right? But so did the EU, yeah, as well. So the, the, uh, the advanced purchase agreement that we're doing, yeah, is de, de facto a de risking upfront payment, yeah. So it's also de risking, okay. So, US has been a, a very generous uh, beneficiary, uh, the EU as well, and, and other countries. Yeah. So, that's the whole po point. And of course, you can't do this all the time. No. Because, you know, and, and, and basically, it's a public health crisis. You can allow that to, uh, to do so. But I think the, the, on top of that, the fact that we get the vaccines, what we also talked about during mm. the break is that you also now have a platform. You now actually have a scientific vaccine platform, which has been, you know, created so that for future challenges, we, c we can expect that we will benefit from the investments that we've seen here. And that's an add-on benefit for everyone. Yeah, I mean, it must be amazing for a person as you, Morten, like seeing so many scientific things like who has been talked about for years now actually going, going out from academia to being part of startups or like being used for vaccines. I mean, yeah. It's... Very, very exciting yeah. to be <laughs> in the middle of uh, this because all the technologies is being put into the pot, you can say, and stirred. And now we see how the flavors are uh, coming on yeah. uh, later on. And that's very exciting. Yes. But yeah, is that a good question? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you see vaccine of the world population develop when a vaccine is ready and what action do you think are necessary to eradicate COVID? So, uh, I'm just reading. Yeah, I, uh, yeah what, what we don't know at yeah. the moment is whether the vaccines that are currently in the press, whether they will reduce transmission as well. Uh, they have an endpoint which which is uh, the uh, symptoms at the moment. Actually, we don't know whether it's also uh, very effective against severe COVID. Um, we have some indications that it probably is. But what about transmission? Can it also hinder transmission of, of, of the virus? That's uh, going to be very interesting to follow in the next uh, half year. And that's also why, just to be absolutely clear, the, the general behavior that we have put in our society must not change yeah. for a long time until we see high-level data or mega data that you actually are changing the nature of the pandemic. It would be wrong to think that because I got a shot, I'm not transmitting. Exactly as you say, I, I have a certain percentage of being protected, it's, it will not be 100%, but I could still transmit and so forth. And that's something we will learn as we go on. So it's an extremely important point. And that's why the good question here, no one can answer. We can speculate. Yeah. <laughs> but what it will take is an immense, an immense effort. And let's be clear, very few viruses have been eradicated. You can keep it on a controlled <laughs> yeah. body eradication. It is not as easy. That requires global flock immunity. And, and that will not happen in one year, it won't happen in two years, it will require more than that. That's my guess, before you have a global uh, control of it. It is, I mean, the, the only virus that has been so far eradicated in is, is smallpox. Yeah. I mean, it's only in, in freezers, but that is because the only known natural reservoir of smallpox is humans. Mm -hmm. There is no animal reservoirs. And not going into various <laughs> other <laughs> reservoirs, uh, uh, no. reservoirs uh, uh, on this because it's been talked about so much. Mm -hmm. But I think that's another thing that we need to understand because if there are, uh, apart from humans, other reservoirs of COVID-19, it's going to be very difficult to eradicate. So, so maybe the goal isn't eradication. Maybe the goal is meaningful control, which is also good enough. I mean, we yeah. can live with other viral diseases on a good control where you reduce mortality and morbidity but it's not eradicated. So I think that's probably a more reasonable... It's a good question, but it's yeah. a, a question we can easily better answer. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say um, when, I mean, yeah, when the world will be totally free of uh, COVID or if it ever... It probably never will, but I mean, I mean, at least our living circumstances will probably be less... Uh, yeah, less um, affected. Is that a last good one? Um, Okay, so 
Uh, will you all be getting the first upcoming approved vaccine when given the opportunity? Uh, I mean, let's. I mean, I, oh, who should we start with? I mean, let's start with you, Morten. <laughs> I mean, you probably would. Yeah. Um, the, the thing is that it will not be given to me uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> first instance yeah. uh, because I'm not in the target uh, population. But I would say yes. Yeah. Of course, and the thing is, and I think I think I, I can uh, say what you mean, and that is normally we think about vaccines as something that saves lives. Yeah. Actually, in this instance, the a vaccine, a general vaccine, would create life on the globe again because we are all in lockdown and have no life. You can say so. A vaccine will create life again on the globe. And what about you two? Would you take it as well? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Not a second hesitation. But again, I mean, you have also approved it, right? I, I have. <laughs> I, I have also said I'll take the first shot, but I probably won't be first in line, as yeah. you say. Yeah, so yeah. Unless I sneak in in front of Sir Brostrom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, but I mean, if there is, <coughs> is there any like really? Because otherwise, I think we are at on time. And then I will say thank you to all of you. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I, f I feel we put together like an A-team about COVID uh, and fast-tracking vaccine development. I mean, I have at least really enjoyed all your speeches. And we have uh, in these COVID times, I mean, I would like to give you my hand and say thank you. But I mean, there is a small present behind your chair that I a bottle of wine. I mean, maybe instead of your gin and tonic later, you can enjoy... Uh, a glass of wine, at least you can think about it. Um, but I mean, yeah, um, and then I will um, talk to this camera uh, and yes, <laughs> and say thank you to all the viewers we have had today. I mean, we really enjoyed it. Um, and I think at, at the highest point, we were actually about around 240 viewers, which I feel personally is amazing. I mean, especially in these digital times where we cannot hold a physical event. I feel, I mean, this attendance is amazing to see and and all you life science students being so grateful for this opportunity. And then I will show you a bit about what Synapse has planned in the next couple of weeks. Firstly, we have um, a first job in life science where there will be some speeches about uh, both from speakers, Ella, both from people who have recently taken a job and how you actually get a job. Uh, and that will be on the 10th of December. Uh, so that is going to be an interesting one. And then we are all, our hops in both Lund and Olbo has also something interesting uh, upcoming. Firstly, Lund has planned like Ella has. <laughs> has an um, uh, event about consulting in life science coming up and um, where um, BCG and, uh, will be present. And we, there will also be talk about the regulatory affairs and the clinical development. And lastly, our hub in Aalborg is having an event about sustainability in life science, uh, where there will come different speakers uh, within susta uh, sustainability and talk about how they ended up there and what they are doing within this field and uh, making the world more green. And then I will say, yeah, thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, again, it has been amazing and uh, having all you being here. So yeah. And with this, I would end this uh, end the stream and say goodbye. Uh, see you next time. Yeah.